Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandy, and what I've noticed today in churches around the world even is a lack of the Word of God. There's also a lack of the presence of the Holy Spirit, but you know what? The Word of God is what's so important. God has magnified His Word above His name, but somehow we just want to remove it from the church. I'm going to talk about for the next two days, what if there was no Word? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word, but if there's no Word, there's no faith. Grab your attention. Join me today as we talk about the beauty of the power of the Word of God. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Good to have you here today. Of course, I'm going to talk on one of my favorite things today, and that is the Word of God, the thing that has made me and, and just honestly, just I built my life around it, built my life on it, and it just it's the thing that gives you such stability each and every day. Uh, my favorite verse of Scripture in the Word of God, I cite it on my sign a book is Isaiah 33, 6. Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of your times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. That verse simply puts it right down to it. What is the stability of your life? It is the Word of God. And so the Word of God is what the New Testament says, alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. It's the thing that judges you. It's the one that makes you stable, the Word of God. And so today what we have, sadly, is in many churches, we have a lack of two things a lack of the presence of the Holy Spirit, but also a lack of the Word of God. And, uh, you know, for so long, you could go to a church that was excessively in the Holy Spirit, excessively in the Word of God. Today, you're having a hard time finding either one of them in a church. There's no presence of the Holy Spirit. Everything comes down to a clock. Everything is timed to a certain point to where the people get out precisely the right time, and there's no power and presence of the Holy Spirit there. Now, I'm not saying that the presence of the Holy Spirit is there, you're going to run all afternoon, because that is wrong, too. I'm saying this. Jesus came and was born on time. Jesus was entered into his ministry at the, right, at the right time and the correct time. Jesus went into his public ministry at the right time. Jesus was crucified on time, resurrected on time, and went to heaven on time, and yet still had time for the Holy Spirit's ministry in his life. I'm saying this, you can have a church that begins and ends on time and maybe a little fluctuation in there, but you can have the presence of the Holy Spirit when you allow him to move. And many times pastors are afraid to have the Holy Spirit move because they think it's going to dominate the whole church service. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman and he understands people. So there must be an opening for that. But also what's happening today is there's a trend away from the word of God. Maybe having stories, throwing a verse in there and saying by that we're we're coming to the word of God. The word wasn't there to enhance your stories. Your stories are there to enhance people in the word of God. So the word should be much and your stories should be few. In fact, most of your stories should be the Old Testament. Let the word of God confirm itself. The New Testament says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says that the word of God was given to us as examples and the Old Testament given to us as examples so that when we teach New Testament realities, there's Old Testament stories that go right along with that. George Barna said in 2010, he said, the church has become theologically illiterate. If it was that way in 2010, you can imagine how theologically illiterate we are today in churches. Congregation members know today less of the fundamental biblical principles than ever that are found in Hebrews chapter six, verses one and two. The Great Commission and even base doctrines are being watered down today to where they're treated as if they're not that important. If you have to do other things, fine. But listen, the word of God is what your stability comes from and the strength of your salvation, Isaiah 33, six says, by understanding the word of God, you can know that you know that you know you are born again. 80% of American churches doubt the infallibility of the Bible. A minority of Christians relate Easter even with the resurrection of Jesus. They think more about Easter eggs and Easter buddies and chocolate on Easter than they do about the resurrection of Jesus. Christians are becoming isolated from society because they don't understand the true needs 
of people around them. They try to come to natural needs and then somehow feed spiritual needs into that, maybe. We give away more food and clothing today in churches than at any other time before, but we have less witnessing and less discipleships. I look at it this way. The food we give away and the clothing we give away, we are nothing more than just an organization like the Goodwill or Salvation Army, some other charity of which we just give food and clothing away. That's not the point. We are to give food so people can be taught about the bread of life. We give them clothing so they can be clothed with the robes of righteousness. Everything we use is a tool for the greater thing, and that is them finding Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then joining a church, becoming committed to the things of God, then becoming prosperous in their own life by the word of God and by getting a job and doing all these things, and they can begin to give to others. We have less witnessing today in discipleship than almost any time in history, especially here in the United States. Time Magazine had an article in there, How Our Churches Minister to Youth a number of years ago. They said we've given them cool videos. We let them have cutting music and hear cutting edge music in their youth department. But when they friends or parents have life-threatening diseases, they are given no answers to that or any life-threatening financial situations, and then they abandon church. Psalm 11 and verse three says this, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? I want you to notice what that verse says. It doesn't say, what will the sinners do? If the foundations are destroyed, what will the righteous do? The foundation is the righteousness found in the word of God that enhances our righteousness. It is the absolute truth of the word of God. The word of God does not just contain truth, it is truth. Jesus said, sanctify them. He was praying to the Father, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus didn't say, I am a truth. He said, I am the truth and the life. Some things in church always change and have for centuries. Music changes. There's always older people getting upset with the younger people's music saying, why can't we have it the same way when I was a teenager, I was 20 or 30 years old, the same type of music, but they forget something. Their parents were complaining against them. And they were saying, why can't we have the hymns we did back in the 40s, the 50s, and even back in the late 1800s, early 1900s? Technology changes. I'm glad technology has changed. Man, I bet when they first introduced the PA system in a church, many people began to yell out, this is worldliness coming into the church. I know this happened when they put the pipe organ in church that people thought that this was bringing the world into the church. Well, if the world creates something and it can be used in church, then use it for the glory of God. It was that way with television when I was growing up. The technology of television was looked down by people saying, well, they're just letting the world in. That's gonna be the one-eyed devil that's gonna let us see into the world and what the world's doing out there. Dress has changed today. We dress more casually for church today than ever, but I have no problem with that because we wanna look like society does and not look like we're trying to be better than them. And so we dress, of course, we dress modestly, but we dress like the world does. Jesus, one day it struck me, Jesus was in the street and on one day, this is Matthew 22, 23, that area right in there, Jesus was on the street, walked in and taught in the temple, walked back out, then walked back into the temple and taught again in the next chapter. You know what it doesn't say? That he went into the restroom and changed clothes. The same clothes he had on the street was the same clothes he had in the temple. The, the, word, the uh, clothes in the temple came right back out to the street. Jesus just looked like other people around him and he taught. It wasn't the dress. It wasn't the dress code. It was the word of God that was taught. Some things in church will never change though. That's the teaching of the word of God. The ministry and power of the Holy Spirit, our views of sin, our views of righteousness, our views of a normal Christian way of life should never ever change and our standard must be and always should be the word of God. The teaching of the word changes converts into disciples and changes the power to live righteously and then resist sin. Psalm 1 says this, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. You can change that word law to the word of God. His delight is in the word of God. And in God's word, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted beside the rivers of water that bring forth fruit in its season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. 
The ungodly are not so, but like the chaff. This is tumbleweeds, which the wind blows away. I didn't finish that whole Psalm, but I can tell you this, it's coming back to the importance of the word of God. In fact, the Psalms, which are part of the laws of God, the way we live starts out with one about the word of God, it says. We're to meditate in it day and night. Then we will be like a tree planted beside the river of water. Years ago, my wife and I and the kids drove out to California. We drove through the very edge coming into California. And of course, we went through the desert that was there. And in it was the Colorado River that ran through. But it was interesting, all across that desert, things were brown, little spots of green here and there. But beside that river, it was green on both sides all the way on the Colorado River. Why? Because a tree beside a river doesn't care about if it rains or not. A tree beside a river doesn't care how hot it gets, doesn't care how dry it is, doesn't care if there's drought conditions around because it's fed from the river. This verse says that if we're born again and we are walking by the word of God, we are like a tree planted beside the rivers of water. Our fruit will never wither. Whatever we do will prosper. I'm not saying we don't face bad times, but we have a river to draw from, and that river is the word of God. The unbelievers are not so. They're not even like a, a tree that's planted far away from the river that just barely survives. This verse says they're like a tumbleweed, and they are dead already, but they're just being blown wherever the wind blows. And that's happening so many today with Christians that they're in churches and stuff where the word is not being taught and they have no foundation. And whatever winds of doctrine come along, they can go for it because if it sounds good, we'll do it. But if it's not part of the word of God, they don't even know that. Christians without the word are no better off in their strength, direction in life than the world itself. It's mainly up to the local church, the pastor to teach the word of God. You know, I guess if I really had a choice, between the word and the Holy Spirit. And I had and I had no church to go to, and there was no church in town that had a good combination of both. I would go to a church that teaches the word. Because why? Well, because the word of God is all the things the word of God talks about. Yes, the Holy Spirit's important, but I guess truly, if I had to bring it down to like percentages or something, I'd rather have 80 to 90% of what goes on the church service revolve around the word of God and then have that 10%, maybe 15% where that's that flow of the Holy Spirit. Even Paul said that. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all, but in the church. I'd rather hear five words that I can understand than 10,000 words in tongues. What he's saying is basically that I thank my God I speak in tongues more than you all, but in the church, he was saying, most of my speaking in tongues is outside the church. Does that tell you something? Most of the move of the spirit in your life should be out in front of the world. It's your guide, it's your helper for witnessing. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you to be my witnesses. That's what Jesus said in Acts chapter one and verse eight, when he was telling the disciples they were going to receive the Holy Spirit. But in church, the main thing we come for is the preaching of the word of God. The word of God mainly belongs in the church service that because that's where we make disciples. But the power presence of the Holy Spirit should be with us in our witnessing out here. And honestly, even the nine gifts of the Spirit are basically given to us to help win people to the Lord. Jesus operated in word of knowledge when he led people to the Lord. And he said to one man, he said, I saw you, Nathaniel, sitting under a tree. He said to the woman that sat by the well, he said, you've had five husbands and the one that you're living with now is not your husband. And through that, he helped lead to the Lord. So I'm simply coming back to this. What should be the major things, pastors, we teach in the church service? The word, the word, the word, with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit there, but we teach them the word of God. See you right after the break because we have a great offer for you. John 1.1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Without the word of God, our lives would be unstable and without direction. There would be no hope for believers or, for that matter, the entire world. In this seven-part series, Pastor Bob Yandian emphasizes and explains the vital necessity of the Word of God in the life of every believer. Sermon titles include A More Sure Word of Prophecy, The Inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God's Reputation, The Wisdom of God's Word, The Merchandise of Wisdom, Wisdom, Riches, and Honor, and Jesus, our wisdom. To order Importance of the Word, visit our website at bobyendian.com. 
Remember your birthday parties growing up? You were five, six, seven years old. All your friends came over and they brought gifts, saying happy birthday to you. And you tried to act so humble, but you were looking at those gifts because they brought them for you. Let me give you something horrible. What if they all turned around and gave those gifts to each other and then went home and didn't give them to you? Welcome to Christmas. It's his birthday, but we give presents to each other whether we need them or not and forget this was his birthday. And what if the wise men would have given their gifts to each other and not to the baby Jesus? They needed that finances because they went off to Egypt for two years. And that's what Joseph used in the time they were in Egypt Then probably started his business on the amounts left over when they got back. Why not give the greatest gift to Jesus? And that is the spreading of the gospel and also the teaching of the word of God. What if you gave the greatest value gift to a ministry? If there's anything the body of Christ needs today, it's God's word taught, explained, and revealed. Why not give a Christmas offering this year and give it to Bobby Andy Ministries because I'm going to use it just for that. Go to the BYM website and find the word donate and give there. And I'll tell you what, I'll appreciate it. And so will those who hear the word of God because I've got some great vision for this year coming up. Thank you ahead of time. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Mark chapter 16 verses 15 and 16 give us the great commission. Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. If you can underline, underline the word world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who believes not will be damned. The first part of the great commission is go into all the world and preach the gospel. What's the first one for? To make to make converts out of sinners, to make sinners into saints. This is what happens when they believe in the gospel. But the second part of that, which Jesus gave both of these at the same time, it's just that Mark reported the first part and Matthew reported the second part. In Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. So go and teach. The Greek word for teach is mathetuo. It means to make disciples. Go Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I have commanded you, and I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. Notice that verse says this, that with Mark in spreading the gospel, we preach the gospel. But when it comes to teaching, we teach them, and this is what makes disciples. Preaching makes converts. Teaching makes disciples. And this can be seen so well and the man at the gate, beautiful, that had been laid there. And this man was paralyzed from the time he was a young child. And the people knew him, saw him there every day. And when Peter and John came by, Peter said to him, we don't have any silver and gold, but we do have something to give to you. You see, silver and gold just was the man's symptoms. He didn't have any money. But the reason he didn't have any money is he was paralyzed. And so Peter was about to go and take care of the entire problem from the base of it, the root of it. And that's why he told him, he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. You know what? This man probably was not a Christian. But by he jumped, by the time he jumped the second or third jump, he was probably a Christian. He gave his life to Jesus Christ, probably even knew about the plan of redemption. But the moment he was healed, he gave his life to Jesus. And as soon as he quit walking and leaping and praising God, he followed them into the temple. That's where disciples are mostly made. Yes, they can be made on the job if we have a Bible study or in a, in a home cell group or something. But in the church service, from the one that's called to be the pastor, we have the teaching of the word of God. So the gospel creates converts, but the word of God creates disciples. And this is what we're talking about. Mankind includes sinners and saints, unbelievers and believers. And so the word of God is divided into two parts. First, Timothy chapter two and verse four says, who will have all men to be saved and come to the full knowledge of the truth. So the first part of the word of God simply tells us how to get people saved and how to be saved. Honestly, if we were to take only the sections of the Bible 
that teach about how to get saved or how to lead a person to the Lord, the Bible would be about this thick because the other 95% of the word of God is discipleship. In other words, Old Testament and New Testament, it's admonition to believers, admonition to believers in the Old Testament, admonition to believers who are called Christians in the New Testament. So the gospel is for sinners to make them into saints, but the gospel is to be given primarily in the world. That's where it's mainly preached. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. So honestly, it's all right to make the gospel available in a church service, but the bulk of what is taught should be taught to Christians on how to make them strong, to ground them, to root them in the word of God so they can be strong in the world around us. That's the purpose of church. Now, yes, we can get people saved. In fact, it's easy ministers to, in the midst of your sermon, weave a little bit of information on there about how a person can receive Jesus because that's the most simple part of the service is receiving Jesus. You don't have to make it long. It can be simple. It can be very short uh, teaching woven into your sermon, but the rest of it is how to make believers into disciples. Doctrine is for saints to make them into disciples. Doctrine is primarily given in the local church and is mainly taught. But again, we come back to it. Oftentimes people don't want the word of God. I've even heard churches that do preach the word of God, people leaving saying, well, the church no longer meets my needs. What you mean is the no longer the church meets your wants. If the minister is preaching the word, he is meeting your need. The need for the believer is to grow in the word of God and you never, ever stop growing. There is no end to spiritual growth in the Christian life. And if you could live to be 200 years old in this earth and go to church all of your life, you still need more of the word of God because the word of God has no limit to the height and depth, the breadth and the length of the word of God in your life. Psalm 138 verse two says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and for your truth, for you have magnified your word above all of your name. The word name there means reputation. God has literally, if he's lifted anything up above the name that he has, uh, has uh, obtained throughout all of history, his reputation, what he would put above that would be the word of God. The Holy Spirit's not lifted above him, but the word is. I'm here to tell you again, the most important thing you need in your life is the value of the word of God. There is where stability comes from. Power comes from the Holy Spirit, but your daily walk in front of the world must line up with the word of God, that the word of God becomes your standard for every day. How should we look at the word of God? Well, Job chapter 23 and verse 12 tells us, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I esteem the words of his mouth, that's God, God's mouth, more than my necessary food. The word of God is the bread of life, not only for our lives, but those of the congregation. And we as ministers, pastors, if you're watching, Sunday school teachers, if you're listening, those who head up cell groups and all that, or you, you give your children the word of God, you teach them that this should happen, that it becomes the bread of life. We are to feed them the word of God because anything else is poison. The things of the world are poison. And so the word of God contains the bread of life and anything outside of that, honestly, is killing in this life today. We're seeing society die around us today because there's less of an impact of the word of God than ever before because Christians know less of the word of God than ever before. Paul prophesied what the church would be like in the last days. Second Timothy chapter four, verses two through four, preach or proclaim the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Folks, we are there. What that word means endure is they don't want to sit through a whole sermon. They want to be very short. They want to be have some entertaining points to it and maybe mention a scripture. But pastors, you need to understand something. If your sermon is 45 minutes to an hour, that's all right. If people get a little irritated at that, I'm going to tell you this. Those that are disciples will tell you, I wish you to preach longer. For the time will come, verse 3, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own lusts, 
their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the tooth and shall be turned unto fables. You know what fables are? Just stories. They can be true stories or not true stories, but they try. pastors often use anything to enhance the word of God. I have something to challenge you. For those of you who came up out of denominational churches or maybe still attend denominational churches, how many points is a sermon supposed to have? Three. Everybody knows that. I mean, you've learned that from the time. They always had a three-point sermon and they try to make the sermon. And if you ask them why do you teach three-point sermons, you know what they'll tell you? Well, it helps the people remember the sermon. I ask you a question. Do you remember any of those three-point sermons growing up? No, because why? It's not the points that are the issue. It's the revelation in the scriptures that are the issue. When a minister preaches and teaches the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit is present, and he shows revelation out of a scripture that perhaps people haven't seen before, but yet it's been right in front of their eyes the whole time, that suddenly explodes inside of them, and that's what they walk away remembering for the rest of their life. It's not your human viewpoint. It's not your human three points. What it is is the Word of God and the Holy Spirit working together that the Holy Spirit leads and guides into all truth. He explains the truth, reveals the truth, and we get wisdom from the Word of God. So we're gonna be talking about uh, when we come back tomorrow, I'll get into the beginnings of this. What if there was no word? All right, we've seen this, these things before where the Bible talks about certain points, but I'm gonna turn a lot of issues around and say, take a verse of scripture talking about the word of God, then we're going to turn it the other way and talk about what if there was no word of God. I simply wanna take a look at one verse of scripture. Jeremiah chapter one and verse 12 said, then the Lord said to me, you have well seen for I will watch over my word to perform it. Listen to this. If there was no word, there'd be no performance of it. God watches over his word to see to it, it comes to pass. If we don't preach the word of God and there's no word of God in people's hearts, then what does God have to look at to perform? My whole life, and I trust your whole life, is revolved around the importance of the word of God. I mean, there's been times I've been in church service and I've heard somebody minister on something and being raised in church, you know, there almost gets to be this cockiness after a while. Well, you can't preach anything I haven't heard. And the Lord delights in showing you things that have been right there in front of your eyes that you've never seen before. And it's been right there in scripture all the time. And so all of a sudden you get a revelation. You know what that does? From that day on, it changes your life in that particular area. When you think back on a particular point from the word of God, what you begin to think is, oh, I remember brother so-and-so preached on this. I remember the day the revelation of it hit me because with all you're getting, get understanding. This is what we're talking about. Not just revelation, but an understanding of what was there because it's the understanding that sticks with you. It's the understanding that comes with you and you use it in your everyday life. Now you can take that revelation you received on Sunday housewives, and make tuna fish sandwiches for your children the next day, still meditating on that promise. And you become a better housewife. You become a better partner in marriage. You become a better friend to those around you. You become even more important in your Sunday school groups, in your evening Bible studies, in your classes that you attend. Why? Because now there's an understanding of the word of God. And oftentimes when even ask, is there anybody have any comments on what we're teaching? If it's something you've understood, you can add a comment that people look at you and go, wow, that was really good. Because why? The revelation given by the pastor to the congregation is given to you so you can go out and give it to other people. Help to change it. This is where it comes back to. Discipleship comes from the word of God, whether it's, all, whether it's in the church service mainly or comes from believer to believer as you share what you learn in church and people go, wow, that's really great. Causes them to want to go study the word of God and we actually end up helping to change each other's life. Not because we're so good, but the word of God is so good and God has simply exalted and lifted up his word above everything else, even in the universe. Tomorrow, we're going to come back to these points. And I want you in the meantime, begin to prepare yourself because tomorrow we're going to have a great time understanding what if there was no word? What would our life be like and what would our church be like? So have a good day. I'll see you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. 
Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.